getting information from a website to a contract. Um, and that's something that we do at Reality Keys. Um, but I want to talk something about something a bit broader today. I want to talk about, talk about truth. So this is kind of our ideal smart contract. This is our fire insurance contract. So um, I, I've kind of skipped the stuff where we set up a, a, a policy, um, but we've just got the, fun the claim function there. So what we'd like to be able to do is um, we'd like to speak to the ultimate absolute truth contract that knows everything and get the answer back. Um, now, unfortunately, that contract doesn't exist. And what is truth anyway? So what I want to do today is just talk through a little bit of theory um, and then go into some practical um, uh, problems and some solutions. And then hopefully at the end, you'll see where it all ties in. So there's this idea running right through Western civilization, right through from Plato up to at least the beginning of the 16th century, that there's objective truth. It's out there. It's consistent. It's eternal. It's absolute. Um, and this originally it was thought to apply not just to kind of factual stuff, like has my office burnt down, um, but also to um, moral stuff, um, to, to values. Um, then, and, and then in the, in the early um, sort of Christian thinking, they took this whole uh, foundation with them, um, and they also had a hierarchy. So you had the pope at the top, and the pope was infallible. So you've got objective truth, and you, you can pretty much find out what it is, at least about certain things. Um, and then in the 16th century, Martin Luther made his epic shit post nailed to a door on a, on a church in Germany. A allegedly, this is, um, this is disputed. Um, and he says, you're doing it wrong. And after that, we had kind of hundreds of years of, of religious wars in Europe while people fought over their con conceptions of the, the absolute objective truth. Um, and one of the strategies that allowed people to stop killing each other and, and live together um, was to separate truth into different baskets. So you had things like scientific truth, which is considered kind of objective and that you shouldn't dis really disagree about. Um, and then you had other value judgments that were, were, not, were not considered objective. Um, and even this bit of, um, of objectivity is something that some recent philosophers have got a little bit suspicious of. Um, so postmodernists think something more like this. Truth is agreement in language. So the idea is that um, when we uh, make claims, we're playing a language game. We've got a kind of a consensus uh, system. And something is true to the extent that it follows the rules of that language game. right? So it's true um, if you obey the consensus rules. Now, while this has been going on, there's something kind of weird happening in politics. Um, the internet is having this weird kind of crisis about truth. So we've got, on the one hand, this vast internet of, of knowledge, but at the same time, you've got people quite boldly embracing alternative facts. And you've got basically entirely made up uh, news circulating freely on Facebook um, and deciding presidential elections. And, and this is a hard problem for two reasons. The first is to do with efficiency, and the second is to do with perspective. So I'm, I'm going to take those two in turn, and I want to show you the DAP that we've created to help with the efficiency problem. Um, and then I, I want to talk about an approach called subjectivocracy, which can help with the, um, the perspective problem. So there are people out there on Facebook who are trying to hack your brain. Um, anyone in your social network or any paid advertiser can push claims into your stream, and you have to work out what to believe. Um, but when you're faced with a claim, if you were prepared to spend a lot of time and money evaluating it and researching it, then you could probably um, do quite a good job at getting to the bottom of it. Um, but since you're not prepared to do that, you end up potentially believe, uh, believing a lot of bullshit. Um, and this is a kind of a pattern that you see a lot in information security um, and also in, for example, missile defense. That there's this asymmetry between the attacker's job and the defender's job because the attacker can just hit us with the entire, this entire barrage of bullshit. Um, and we've got to defend every time to be successful. 
Um, and even if the attacker can't manage to get their bullshit through every time, they can bring off a kind of a denial of service attack against the truth. Because if you can hit people with enough stories um, and enough claims, they just lose confidence that they can evaluate any of them. And then when they see something true, they, 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 can't, um, they, can't, they can't evaluate that either. So you end up being able to steal from them without them, them noticing. So what we've tried to do is to increase the, the cost of attacking and decrease the, to the, the cost of defense. So this is reality check. Um, this is mechanical Turk uh, meets Snopes on the blockchain. Uh, the rule is that anybody can ask a question and anybody can answer a question. Um, and that anybody can be you or it can be your contract. So we make no, no, no distinction there. And the goal is that people who give the right answer are going to get rewarded and make profits, and people who give the wrong answer are going to make losses. So we can ask a question like this. This is via the, the DAP, um, or like this, using uh, a contract. So we're passing in a template ID there that I won't get into. Um, there's also the text of the question, a challenge timeout, and an arbitrator. I'll say a bit about the, the arbitrator later. So the question is going to show up on the blockchain and, and therefore on this uh, website. Um, and you can come, out, come, come in and if you see a question you know the answer to, then you can post an answer like this um, or from a contract like this. Now, when you post an answer, you're also sending some money. Um, this is a bond. So this is money that you're going to lose if you're wrong and you're going to get back if you're right. Uh, and by wrong and right, I mean um, that your answer, whether your answer is decided by the system as the final answer. Now, every time you, you post an answer, if you, if you see an answer that's wrong and you want to correct that answer, um, you can always do that, but you have to double the bond. So once that's happened, and once the timeout uh, period is, is elapsed, um, you can get the final answer from your contract like this. Um, so if we know the question ID, we just pull it in, um, and that, that'll give us our answer. Um, sometimes you want to do something more like this. Sometimes you didn't ask the question yourself, but you want to take any answer that adequately answers a particular question, um, also with a reasonable arbitrator and with a reasonable timeout. Um, so you can, in that case, you can get the final answer if it matches these particular criteria. So your user can send you a question ID, and then you, you check that question ID with the contract. And if it's right, you go ahead and, and use the answer. So you're probably wondering what happens if somebody um, keeps on putting money on something that, that's untrue and is prepared to put serious money to back their, their, their lie. Um, and what happens is, it, is the first thing that happens is it's going to escalate. Um, so you end up with quite a lot of money in bonds uh, resting on this particular uh, question. And then once that happens, we get a serious amount of money in the pool, and somebody is going to want to, to use that money um, to pay our arbitrator. Now, the arbitrator sounds like a person, and it can be a person, um, but it's a contract. So it can also be a decision-making process. Um, it doesn't have to be cheap. It doesn't have to be fast, but it does have to be able to get us our answer, and we do have to trust it. So it's kind of like the, the pope in the medieval um, metaphysics there. Um, now, for a lot of purposes, this is going to be the right solution, and we're going to be able to construct an arbitrator that suits your security needs. Um, in particular, it's often going to be better than what people have been doing at the moment, where they're pulling data from some website. And, and even if the middleware that gets them that data is correct, that website is their pope. Um, and often the website or the websites that you're pulling from, um, even if they're backed by some fairly reliable provider, aren't actually secured with the kind of assumptions that we make when, when we're dealing with magical internet money. So we've got ourselves to a place where we don't have to call on this arbitrator very often, and we can use an expensive process. So, so the, the, lip, the, the arbitrator could literally hire somebody to go down and look at my office and see if it's burnt down. Um, out of the gate, this is a service that we'll be offering at Reality Keys, but we also think it's a great fit for things like all, um, industry consortiums. If you've done any work in the private blockchain space, it seems like everyone wants to make a consortium uh, to do blockchain stuff, and then they come and talk to guys like us, and they say, what should I do with my consortium? Um, this is really somewhere where um, these existing industry players could leverage their, um, their existing brands and, th and their expertise. You can also make this a socially expensive process. So for example, if you've had an ICO and you've got a, um, 
um, you, you, you've got some people who are supposed to be delivering particular milestones, you might say, we want to pay them if they reach these milestones, and we're going to check that with reality check, but the arbitrator is going to be a vote of the token holders. So in most cases, you're not going to have to call on them, but if you do, then you can. So reality check doesn't care. It just lets you supply your arbitrator, and it sets things up so that the arbitrator only has to get called on um, if very occasionally, and that when they do get called on, they can charge very attractive fees. So this is our attack, uh, our um, application deployed on um, on the Rinkby test net. Um, I've also posted our Gitter channel there. Um, the plan is that we're going to um, take feedback for a couple of weeks on the details of the API and stuff, in case anyone here has any thoughts. Um, then get it out to one audit and um, hopefully have it, um, you know, live on on the mainnet fairly soon. So. That's the efficiency problem, but I want to talk about another problem, which is perspective. So for four years, we've been serving data on the question, what is the price of Bitcoin? And that's been a fairly factual question for most of that time. There, there was a point when we had some funny data coming from Mt. Gox, um, which eventually went away. Um, but generally speaking, it was fairly straightforward. Um, but then ne next month, when the fork happens, this becomes a fairly contentious question. Um, and it's really not clear at all what the right answer is going to be to the question, uh, what's the price of Bitcoin? You know, there are going to be at least two or three uh, Bitcoins around that, that you could possibly take the price of and maybe you should add them together and, you know, who knows. So that, that's a question that really depends on your point of view. And perspective is quite a tricky problem for consensus systems. Um, if you look at the original problem that Bitcoin was trying to solve, um, you've got all these nodes on the network, and they all have a different perspective on the network. So they all see transactions at different times. And what you want to know is, um, given two transactions that have been sent, which one was sent earlier? Um, and that's something that, about which every node will legitimately have a different opinion. So, so Satoshi just kind of punted on this. And Satoshi's genius was to realize that it was actually okay to punt on this question. So Bitcoin or, or, or Ethereum will just really just pick one. Um, and It'll, you know, and, and what it'll promise you is that if you, give, if, if you ask it again, then with an increasing probability, it'll give you the same answer again. So if we're trying to get the truth of a proposition, it's not really clear that this answer will do it for us. Um, we don't really just want to punt on anything that, that has perspective involved, especially because things like the price of Bitcoin, a lot of the things actually turn out to have perspective when it maybe seemed like they didn't. So we want the answer, but there is no the answer. Now, this is something where we've managed to handle in blockchain systems when we're dealing not with the um, transactions on top of the blockchain, but with the basic rules of governance of the blockchain. So what we did with the, the DAO hack, or what we did with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash was, when there was a serious dispute over governance, we forked the chain. So if you have a Bitcoin before that fork, then you have Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash after the fork. Um, and if you have Ether before the, the fork, you have um, Ether and ETC after the fork. And this gives you kind of a, a slightly strange but um, kind of remarkable kind of security in that, um, especially from the point of view of the minority, if you lose to the, minor to the majority, um, if the decision-making process in force goes against you, you still have the ability to continue with your own chain. You still have the ability to follow your own rules. Um, and it may be that even if in the short term the market goes against you, who knows, maybe in the long term, um, you will also find that your t token is more valuable than the, the other one. And, it, and even if it doesn't, then you still get to do what you want to do. So this is a great fit for handling disagreements about reality. What we can do is embrace perspective and embrace subjectivity. So what we need is opinionated money. So we've written a token contract. It's about 100 lines of solidity. And it commits every day to any number of new worldviews. So every day you can create new branches on it and cause it to fork. Um, and each of those branches will represent a, a different uh, worldview. So in each of those branches, then the, the contract knows how much money you should have um, and it'll allow you to spend money that's, that's, on, the, um, that's on, pa on parallel chains twice, um, but not money that's on the same chain. So it looks something like this. So if we wanted to know, did my office burn down? 
One person might say it did, and one other person might say it didn't. So we have two forks, um, and you can keep your money on, on either or both. Now, once we can do this, your smart contract no longer needs to choose between these different allegedly objective realities. So if you've got a bet on did Trump or, or Hillary win an election, you don't need the smart contract to choose which, one, which of those things happened. You don't even need there to be an objective truth about which one of th those things happened. Um, your contract just pays the person who thinks that Hillary won, on, or who bet that Hillary won on the branch that says Hillary won, and pays the, the person who bet that Trump won on any branch that says Trump won. Um, so, so we can take all of that stuff, all the objective stuff, right out of the contract and put it into the social realm. Um, now, at this point, people always worry that um, if we've got these hundreds of thousands of facts and we're branching on all of them, we're going to have just an unfathomable uh, number of, um, of branches. Um, but this is quite a nice fit for our arbitration contract because our arbitration contracts in reality check represent a process for, um, uh, for, for getting, uh, resolving a bunch of facts. Um, so you have a, a large number of facts that, that are all hid, around, um, hid behind uh, that contract. So what we can do here is um, you commit to a white list of arbitrators. Um, once you think that an arbitrator is bad, you can just remove that arbitrator from the whitelist. Um, or anyone can just publish a branch that removes that, um, that arbitrator from, from the whitelist. And this means that we no longer have to trust our arbitrators, arbitrators. Because if the arbitrator is bad, the economy can just root around them. Um, so we can do this whole thing without needing, needing the, the trust. So very quickly, I just want to compare a couple of code examples. So this is the claim function with a pope, right? This is the claim function with an arbitrator um, who the contract already thinks it's going to trust. Um, so what we're doing there is um, we're checking the question uh, that somebody, fe the qu somebody feeds us the question ID and we, and we check the question. Um, and then we send them, some, in this case, the balance of all the tokens held by the contract um, to that person. Um, this is the same contract on subject of ocracy. So the claim function is a little bit different. We've got a, um, a branch parameter and an arbitrator parameter. And the first thing we do is we go to the token contract and we ask it on this branch, is this, is this arbitrator legit? Um, and if that arbitrator is legit, then we go ahead and all the rest is just the same, except for the very last line where that token payment also specifies a branch. So once we have opinionated money like this, people are welcome to play their own language games and embrace their own worldviews. So you're entitled to your own opinion. Hell, you're also entitled to your own facts. This is Ethereum. It's, it's permissionless. It's free. You can do what you like. Um, but um, if you want to play a language game with somebody else, you're going to have to persuade those other people um, that the, the, the world that you're trying to inhabit is interesting. Um, so we'll see what kind of values the markets actually want to assign to those different branches. Um, and we'll also see what, what, what people actually want to use. So Kellyanne Conway is welcome to her alternative facts if she wants them. That's absolutely fine. Um, but we'll see what universe, what worldview, what set of facts she uses if she wants to, say, insure her house and get reliable data when it burns down. So if, like me, you're excited about this, then um, please come and talk to us on our, on our Gitter channel. Um, I've also uh, put, put a thing you can Google, hard fork all the things. This was a piece I wrote last year about this. Um, also links to Vitalik's um, writing on subject democracy, uh, where he, he did a lot of the legwork. Um, so please, please do, do come and talk to us. Um, the reality token thing, like I say, is nearly ready to go, but this thing, we're, we're still kind of batting around different models. Uh, so we'd love to hear what you think. Okay, thanks.